had the anointing so that he too had a way of clearing his voice <clears throat> that would command attention in the Holy Spirit. He became um, the ideal for most of the young, uh, young preachers matriculating through uh, uh, Philip School of Theology. And in fact, uh, I'm told that his New Testament class was so popular and powerful that on, I think on a Friday, his last class each week, that a lot of the preachers, especially the Baptist preachers of the Atlanta community, would come to his class just to get sermon ideas for the next Sunday morning. He was that, he was that erudite and yet so practical in his preaching. Now, they did not admit him directly into the PhD program. Uh, they admitted him basically as a special student and required that he fulfill some undergraduate requirements. So this is someone who already has a doctorate in theology. And so he's not only our first black undergraduate to graduate from Vanderbilt in 1954, but he goes on and he attains the doctorate in 1958. And I always tell students that what a lonely experience it had to be for him, knowing that he was the first. But I also see him as a visionary because I, I believe in my heart of hearts that he knew that once he came, the door was open. And once he came and he proved himself, clearly others were going to follow in his footsteps. So his emphasis was on you have to think through the faith, that, that what you preach is as important as how you preach it. And so his, his impact was this emphasis on theological training. So he's right in that early moment of um, academic black theology where folks are beginning to say we need to understand how black religion and black religiosity is a part of the academic study of religion. I think it's important that you're telling his story and sharing his legacy because I think too often um, if it's not in a, a time frame that we really hear the name often it's easy to be forgotten but we certainly don't want to forget all the things that he's done. Mm -hmm.